And we are live. Welcome to Ask Lovecraft After Dark, where we all come together to uh, just have ourselves a, a grand old time. Uh, if you don't know, I don't know why you wouldn't know, but I'm your host, Lehman Kessler, uh, creator of Ask Lovecraft. And I have tonight an absolutely fantastic guest, Molly Tanzer. Welcome, Molly. Hello, everyone. Yeah. So, Molly is here. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of her books. Uh, we're going to be talking about Lovecraft and just all that kind of jazz. Uh, if you are following along, there is a little chat bar that I'm going to be monitoring. Uh, feel free to uh, chat along. And if you have questions for Molly, if you have questions for me, be sure to throw those in there. And yeah, let's uh, let's get started by uh, talking about uh, Molly, how we met, which I think was on the Lovecraft easing, if I remember, back I think in the day. So. Yeah, I think we were both on a chat at one point, or maybe at multiple points. Um, yeah, yeah, I because I definitely went back and sort of was trying because I've been trying to find all the easings where mm. um, I, uh, I I made a guest appearance. Uh, I'm really sad. I think for whatever reason we've lost the episode, my first episode in the easing, where Joe Pulver and Pete Rollick uh, and Willem Pugmire grill me in character. Oh, as Lovecraft oh, <laughs> for dang. like 45 minutes, which was uh, intense. To that's really intense. Um, so that's disappear. But and doing and, and looking that up, I was like, oh, there's like me and Molly talking about like Conan or whatnot. So because yeah. Um, I yeah, so we were in these various uh, chats and whatnot, and I I feel like we like bonded initially just over like like talking trash about other people in Lovecraft. Yeah. Not <laughs> Not being Grognards, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like that was our first bonding exercise. Um, yeah, and, same. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, well, I think it's, go ahead. Well, say so I think we, I think like we hooked up uh, right before um, do women like squid, like that yes. whole thing um, blew up. Squid Gate, uh, Squid Gate. <laughs> one of the many gates in the Lovecraftian yeah. world. Uh, yeah, because that was that. Uh, we won't name names, but there was at one point in a very popular uh, discussion group uh, a question about whether or not uh, there were any women in Lovecraftian writing circles, and and why weren't there women out there, and why weren't they submitting to uh, to all the fine periodicals made available to them? Uh, and <laughs> Molly and several folks uh, raised their hand and said, uh, "We're here. You're not." Branding us. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely a debacle just because the I guess we're not naming names. Okay. Well the guy in question, <laughs> like, um I have I have I've described him before and I will again as a formerly prominent editor editor who um which is sounds like a sick burn, but it's also true. But like basically like sort of his decline came when he just kept publishing the same people all over and over and over again. Yeah. Which happens. Yeah. You know, as an editor, you always have to be on the lookout for new voices and new talent and not just access your friends. And because, you know, and I don't know, the kicker was that conversation was just so bananas. But the kicker was he was like, well, I just I had to publish myself in my anthology of like historical <laughs> Lovecraftian fiction, Molly, because I couldn't find enough writers. And I was like, I was literally nominated for a British Fantasy Award for my collection of historical Lovecraftian fiction. So, like, don't tell me about how hard it is to find chicks who do this. Like, so, yeah, it was like an interesting conversation. Um, but my favorite part was the guy who said that women don't write Lovecraftian horror because they've been gifted with the power to create life and so they cannot fully embrace nihilism. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Is wow. I mean, there was a lot. There was a long, it was, it was a it long. It was like 600 long comments long. <laughs> it was a um, huge deal. Well, and just the people who chose this as the hill they wanted to die on. Oh, yeah. Was, I was just, dude, like, even if you feel this way, maybe don't like draw attention to yourself. <laughs> I <Yeah>. don't know. <laughs> but I feel like if you do have that, I don't know, like I feel like personalities like that can't not join in. Like they they just feel this compulsion to be correct. And it's like, but you're wrong and I'm sorry. <laughs> like I, it, it sucks. Like sometimes it's nice to be wrong. Like how I was wrong that Infinity War would be good. I thought oh. it, would be true. it was great, there we go. but we won't talk about it. <laughs> but because uh, I know it's not been out long enough, but I thought I was like, how could it be good? And it was great. Nice. Um, but then, you know, some people just really hate being wrong. And when it's just like, yeah, girls don't do this. And it's like, here are 50 women. And it's just like, well, that's not I mean, like, but 
Well, actually, and it's like, oh, just give up. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So folks in the audience are agreeing with you that Infinity War is awesome. Sorry, I uh, just also for folks who just may have gotten a little confused, I, I shifted my camera slightly to make it a little easier. Oh. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, and like as you said, there's always these these bizarre fights that spring up, and people have to be right, and people have to make sure that other people, uh, that everyone else knows that other people are wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's a big part of it too. Because uh, yeah, I mean, so I had a. Um, uh, I had Alex Houston on first uh, for the first episode of this, and uh, he was the the guy who ran the HP Lovecraft Facebook page for a, oh, wow. a good long while. Um, and and yes, yeah, was like we were talking about all the various gates, all the various fights that just constantly spring up. Uh, but this one had the the rare <laughs> rare good fortune to to a expose a lot of misogyny and a lot of grossness in community, uh, but also a really awesome uh, collection came out of it. Yeah, a couple of anthologies came out in the wake of it, including um, She Walks in Shadows, which was, I think, in the States, rebranded and sold as Cthulhu's Daughters. Oh, that's right. I have the I have the original She Walks in Daughters. Yeah, but I made right. that so, in Canada, the, so. Yeah, the Canadian edition is She Walks in Shadows, and Innsmouth 3 Press put out that, and then Prime Books brought, bought the American rights, and they retitled it Cthulhu's Daughters, Fair. Um, I guess. And um, so there was that, and that was really cool. And a lot of the lady types who joined in on that conversation were part of that and part of the Kickstarter, and that was really fun. And um, I'm really glad that I got a chance to be a part of that because I actually got, um, my story was reprinted in um, the best um, like transgender fiction of the year, like the first of, oh, that's right. of that. Yeah, and so, because my story actually, I don't know, I had to write about the thing on the, doorstep because um one of them another one of the highlights or lowlights whatever you want to call it of that <laughs> incident was when the original uh poster um was like well molly like maybe it's that there aren't that many girls in lovecraft's writing like as you know or it wasn't even like as you know it's like by the way like as an if at the end of the thing on the doorstep doesn't even turn out to be like a woman <laughs> and i had to be like did you just mansplain the plot of the <laughs> Thing on the doorstep to me like <laughs> i know like i know this and so i i wrote a i wrote a riff on it called the thing on the cheerleading squad that's set in 1990 and it's like a we just came back from school and now we're <laughs> from summer vacation and now everything's weird and as it's back at school but she's dressing different kind of weird weirdness that i researched a lot of cheerleading stuff for oh oh weird. yes <laughs> i did well i i i had a co i so i have a job where i do um search engine optimization blogging um, which is about as interesting as it sounds. But uh, for a while there, we were getting all these like wackadoo clients. And one of them was like sports bras for cheerleaders that had all this like stuff, I guess. Oh. I don't know. I had to learn about it and write some, some, some blogs about it. And um, so I had some resources on like, cause they, they made me watch a bunch of these cheerleading videos. And so I kind of had like this stockpile of things that I could watch with like the names of things. And so that was really interesting because I shockingly enough was not a cheerleader in high school. I don't even know if we had them at my arts magnet public <laughs> high school because um, we didn't have a football team, but uh, yeah. So that was really interesting. So the, and yeah, and a couple of other anthologies came out too. Like um, what is it called? The King and Yellow one. Oh yeah. Casilda's daughters. Casilda's yes. Casilda's. Casilda's song. Casilda's song. That's right. That's yes. Song that, that Joe Clover edited, and that was I wrote one of my favorite short stories I've ever written for that one. That is a fantastic story. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, that is so much fun. Um, for folks yeah. who, who who are not aware, uh, Molly as so Casilda song had a lot of great stuff, but but Molly decided to uh, make a a nice little bridging uh, between uh, Chambers and Ayn Rand, <laughs> and found yeah. some very fun parallels. Yeah, I, I, my favorite for any like Rand weirdos that are out there, like of course in Atlas Shrugged, there's the cigarettes, the mysterious cigarettes that she finds everywhere that these guys have been smoking that have a gold dollar sign on the filter, and like the cigarette expert down at the corner shop can't tell her where they came from, and it's this like clue, I guess, or whatever. So in this one, definitely the Chambersian antagonist in it is smoking a cigarette that has like the yellow sign on it and i was just like yes like only seven <laughs> people will get this but i don't care because like it was such a huge part of my childhood so that was a really fun um anthology and then there was and then the, another one that's coming out this year called oh crap um 
Uh-oh. It's been in the works for a while. Uh, Sisterhood, which is coming oh, okay. out the Chaosium, and Nate Peterson is editing it. And it's not necessarily explicitly Lovecraftian, but it's just taken a it's taken a bit to get off the ground for various reasons. And but it is it was another like all lady anthology inspired by some of the sort of concerns that people have. But my story in that is actually street street historical fiction about one of my weird obsessions, who is uh, Thomas Day, who is this 18th century weirdo who okay. It, it, Okay, fine. So Thomas Day, I, I'm obsessed with. He was he is known for being the author of a an abolitionist poem called "The Dying Negro," which was like a huge deal in 18th century England because um, it was against it was an abolitionist poem and it was being read in bars and coffee shops and things like that. And um, it was like this hugely powerful piece of like we shouldn't do this and he was also and thomas day was also like a supporter of american independence and um like a vegetarian and he also wrote this book called sanford and merton which um is no longer very famous but like was basically the children's book that people read forever like charles dickens read it and hated it and um it's weirdly <laughs> referenced in like um a birdie wooster story and all this different stuff. It was just this ubiquitous British children's book about like two, it was like a goofus and gallant story. Okay. Um, for those of you who read Highlights Magazine in the <laughs> 80s um, about like uh, like like these two British children and one, there was like some weird colonial politics in there because one of them was like a child that was brought up in Jamaica under slavery. Oh, he was white, but he was like a, um, a white Creole and he has like emotional problems. And then there's this like, pastoral English child. But anyway, the main reason that anyone should care about Thomas Day and the reason I care about Thomas Day is that, um, so he was this, so he, he, he was this bizarre figure where he, he dressed in all black and he wouldn't wear a wig. And, um, this was considered like extremely bizarre in 18th century England, but he was like a nobleman who inherited his fortune at like 24, 26. So he was really wealthy, but he was also like a little pudgy and like super awkward and therefore like could not find a lady. Um, and part of this was also that he had strong opinions about what a lady should be like, including that she should have plump white arms and not want to, that was just a weird thing that he kept repeating over and over in his diary, um, plump white arms. And, but we would be willing to like live without, like he wanted to live this bucolic existence in the countryside without many of the comforts of modern life in the 18th century. But most of the girls that he was trying to get with were like noble, or at least like upper middle class girls. And they were just like, yeah, pass. Like, I don't really <laughs> want to go live in the woods in a hut and some sort of Rousseauian, because he was obsessed with Rousseau, this like Rousseauian ideal. So he, because he loved Rousseau, he had read Rousseau's Emile, which was about like this kid who gets, this story has a point, um, this kid who is raised in a different way than most children of the time where he's like exposed to cold and the elements and hardship and things to like toughen him and he's allowed to sort of do a Montessori style education and he becomes like this sort of renaissance figure right and um so Thomas Day was like sweet I know what I'm gonna do and what he did was he got his lawyer friend to illegally um to like forge a bunch of paperwork on behalf of his other friend saying that he basically wanted to go to the London orphanage which was this big deal back then and adopt a, a tween um so to tr and and to be a servant in a great house but actually <laughs> what he wanted to do was to adopt this child and then raise her with the ideal education so that then she would become like his perfect wife and he could like train her up from a young age <laughs> and <laughs> then marry her um and so he yeah and he did this he did this twice he adopted two girls and he renamed them sabrina and lucretia oh, and then no. he, yeah they their names were um i can't man i just they had like homely good solid british girl names and then they sure. became sabrina and, and sabrina and and lucretia and so he but but like he had trouble because he, like he couldn't really keep these two 12 year olds in his flat in london and so he absconded with them to france that so he could 
<laughs> so that he could like teach them like how to read and to write and astronomy and philosophy and languages and things, but not French because he wanted to go to France because neither of them spoke French and then oh, therefore oh, no one. Of course, no, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> so they couldn't like you know, sex you know, trafficking. You got to keep these things uh, in line. Well, no, I mean like the weird thing is, I mean, well, I don't know. That's <laughs> <laughs> so. We have a bunch, he was, he, so he was an 18th century dude, right? And so he wrote a ton of letters to his friends and family about this project of his and his lawyer friend who helped him adopt these girls. Um, and it is pretty well agreed upon that he like never outraged their virtue. Like he, he did not, like, I'm not saying he was a great person. Like he obviously was like a lunatic who should not have done any of this or been responsible for any 12 year old girls, but he, apparently was incredibly scrupulous about them in that way. And, and both of them believed that they were being raised to be his, his future housekeeper. But his plan was like air and a spare, right? He would, whichever one he liked better. He would <laughs> See, this is, this is where like the like, oh, well, he had noble intentions. I need a No, no, no. I'm not saying he had noble intentions. I'm saying he did not, he did not attempt to do anything with them that would have violated their like nothing that by the 18th century mind would have been like a true crime. Let's nothing, just put it he, nothing, he wrote, nothing he wrote in his letters anyway. Nothing he wrote in his letters. But there. But the weird thing is, so again, like the weird thing is like, so he decided that Sabrina was more suited to his taste, um, even though she was the less attractive of the two. And so he, and but part of this was that he drew up like a contract with them and he promised that whichever one he did not pick, um, he would like set her up in life. And so he gave Lucretia like um, an annuity of several hundred pounds. This is like in the 18th century, set her up at a milliner's to um, with an apprenticeship. And by all accounts, she lived a very happy life and married and had children and like whatever was fine. Sabrina, unfortunately, had a rougher time of it because he decided that like, okay, I'm keeping her. And so he took her then to the Midlands where all of his friends who were part of like the blue stocking circle lived. And they all knew, again, like they all knew that he was trying to train Sabrina to be his wife. She still did not know. They all kept it from her, but he did all this weird stuff to her where he would like make her take baths in the river behind their house and then like shiver herself dry on the bank to make her cold hearty. And he would like fire guns at her, but like with blanks and then like, so that she would learn to like be okay and not be startled and would drip like hot wax on her arms and then like punish her if she cried out. So anyway, like she had a rough time of it and I'm not making light of this at all because it is terrible. But then like eventually, um, if the story has a happy ending, this is a redeeming story in that um, eventually he was, cause he also was like courting other women during this time. He would like leave her alone for like weeks at a time in the house with the servants and then try to also get with these other chicks who were always just like, <laughs> pass like pass like you are still thomas day like killer of all lady interest and so um so eventually he was like all right all right all right well i guess i did all this work i'm going to propose to sabrina and i'm going to be like okay like i lied to you i know i said i wanted to be my housekeeper but really like i was always training you to be my perfect bride and so he did this and she was like whoa <laughs> what are you talking about and was like definitely not interested in marrying him. And so he released her um, to a boarding house with like an annuity and he was really mad and tried to like convince her and gaslight her into marrying him. And she was like, pass, like no hard pass. Like, first of all, I've known you since I was 12 and you've always been like an older brother and that's just like not what's going to happen here. But weirdly enough, so then he, he moved on and he moved, married some chick who then did agree to his weird plan to live in the forest and, um, and and he died not long after because um, he was so anti uh, violence against animals that he was trying to train a horse to ride without breaking the horse and it kicked him in the head and he died. Okay, well like, there you go. All of this after he was like pouring hot wax on this teenage girl. He was like, "We can't put a saddle on a horse. Like everybody, please slow down." Um, and so there's that. But then so she ended up getting in. So weirdly, and I can't remember how this happened. Um, but then like, so his lawyer friend who helped adopt her, like got in touch with her and then they fell in love and got married. And she had like a bunch of, I know like surprise ending, like they get married and have a couple of kids and then, he, and by all accounts were extremely happy with one another and pleased. And, and, um, and then he died tragically young and she ended up becoming like a matron at a school and like lived to be like 92 years old and beloved of all who knew her.
Dang. Okay, that yeah. is, that is in sort of happily. All right. It, you, is, it was, is a happily ever after. I was a little worried I mean, there in the middle with the. No, you I would know. never. I would never. No, no, no. I know it's 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 sordid and strange, but it's definitely like one of the. It's like the 18th century in England stories where it's like, yeah, okay, weirdest decade. Okay, now now given the <laughs> themes and elements within this story, uh, within yes. this historical event, uh, one can't help but notice uh, traces of Pygmalion, which you have been very public yes. about being. Uh, one of your major influences, and there's That's been elements true. of Pygmalion in in, um, in some of the stories that uh, you've written. Is this is this where that interest began, or were you drawn to this because of the Pygmalion like qualities? I was drawn to it because of the Pygmalion like qualities. Because like so, okay, I get, like again, I'll stop talking about Thomas Day at some point. I swear. But the way I found out about this, I've always loved Pygmalion stories. Like My Fair Lady is my favorite musical, and I'm super into all of the different ways that we retell the story because it's always super weird. I mean, hey, I loved Mannequin, so. Yeah, for sure, see, there you go, there you go. But no, so I found out about Thomas Day because, so so the guy who, okay, so let's keep it straight. There's Thomas Day, and then there's his lawyer friend who forged all these papers, but the man in whose name they forged the papers was this guy named Richard Edgeworth, who was Thomas Day's bestie, and um, oh, like another weird Thomas Day story. He convinced Richard Ed Edgeworth before all of this that when his son, also named Richard, was born, that he should raise the boy like Rousseau suggests in Emile. And um, and so they did all this weird stuff to to young Dick, and he became like the worst and had to go <laughs> into the military because he was so ungovernable. And so it was this, like child rearing fail. Um, <laughs> But yeah, they were like home dogs and they they at one point, like for example, they and be, they were both part of this, like again, like it's the 18th century, so everyone's part of like 70,000 societies. They were part of some society of like experimenters and um, inventors and they together invented some like human powered like bicycle car that they would like tool around the English countryside <laughs> on together. <laughs> And yeah, so anyway, like Richard also had a daughter, Mariah Edgeworth, and Mariah Edgeworth wrote a novel called Belinda that I read when I was doing my master's. And Belinda is a book. I'm not going it, to... It is a notable book, and it is a worthy read if you are into 18th century things, because like, for one, it definitely has a caricature of Mary Wollstonecraft, um, this lady named Harriet Freak, who likes to dress as a man. Um, it's got like gender play. It's got um, like a, like a, all of this stuff, but it also has a parody of Thomas Day, like the love interest of this book of Belin Belinda's main sort of star-crossed love interest is this guy who um, falls for her, but then like can't make an offer because he himself has adopted an orphan and stuck her in a cottage in the forest and will like visit her every once in a while. Cause Mariah like knew Thomas Day and like knew this whole story from her dad. And so like put it as a parody in this novel that she wrote. Um, and so that's how, and I, and I, when I was reading this in my twenties, like I was just like, what? is this and asked my professor she's like oh my god thomas day like holy crap you will love this shit and like like told me all about it and then later i read this book called how how to create the perfect wife by wendy moore who's this amazing pop historian and that's oh i love I, I love her yes she did uh knife the knife man which is one yes. of my favorite uh it's, favorite she's amazing it's like better than, it's like she's it's like true novels like there's all these ups and downs and like, I mean, like, I, and I know with all of her work is like that where you're just following it around like this, this couldn't be better if it was fiction. It's just also weird and like, but she's a great writer and that's where I found out a lot about Sabrina and Lucretia because I only knew the basic story. And I read the book when I was researching my second novel, The Pleasure Merchant, which has like a weird ode to Thomas Day in it. And that's where like a lot of the stuff in that came from. So. Well, the, we are very acquainted with The Pleasure Merchant because I believe uh, that is part of our PH Reads a Thing uh, series. Yeah, PH reviewed it. Uh, in fact, I think uh, I, I was running the numbers and I think uh, PH has reviewed more of your books than possibly anyone else. <laughs> maybe that's, maybe well, that's, that's, your, maybe that's you know, you're just, you're his taste, right? Yeah, no, they are usually like, lubricious in some way i guess i don't know or involve like alcohol or like weird makeouts so <laughs> well the first one uh, was rumbullion which um i got a copy of and oh, yeah. i and i loved you know it was it was just a really fun kind of back and forth lots of different stuff uh a little bit of lovecraft but mostly just like sort of whimsical slightly gross and just <laughs> lovable yeah. stories is that fair yeah, I mean, it's got, it's Rumbully. So there's two versions of Rumbullion out there. One is like a standalone novella, which may or may not be available for purchase on Amazon. 
I don't know. Okay. And then there's Rumbly in the collection, which was a limited edition hardback. That's um, what I have. Yes, you have the you have the collection that was like a very very exclusive and papery gorgeous hardback that Egeus Press did in 2013. But yeah, the story Rumbly it actually is weirdly tangentially related to my first novel Vermilion. Um, but it's I, I pitched it as Rashomon with Fox because it's definitely like a young nobleman has a weird fancy party where the Comte de Saint Germain shows up and ruins everybody's night. And then later in the aftermath tries to figure out what happened, but everybody's accounts are slightly different. So it's got like a lot of weird stuff in there. I don't know. It's good. Yeah, I like it. Although yeah, as, as, we've discussed it. as we've discussed before, Tubby Big Mungus is probably my favorite in there. I have not thought about that story in a really long time. Toby McMungus, for your readership who may not know, it, appears in Fungi, which is another Innsmouth free press anthology that came out a couple of years ago. And um, there's a lot of really cool fungus oriented stories in there. But Toby McMungus is like a, I guess it's like a, rem like a, like a picaresque about a chubby <laughs> cat that makes merkins for a living in like alternate late 17th century. <laughs> England populated by like creatures and yeah. Um, like, it's like horny red wall. <sighs> that makes it sound so perverse, but that's not, in, <laughs> it's not inaccurate <laughs> at all. Yeah. I don't know, but it's good. It's, it's a lot of fun. And, and a lot of the, and a lot of the other stories in it. Was that, was that your first kind of personal collection? Rumbolian? Yeah. Rumbolian is my, well, sort of, nothing I do is normal. So my first, for my first book is a, was a pretty mouth that was put out um, in, it came out in 2012, I think. And that story collects a bunch of my, so I, so again, like um, one of my first published stories was in Historical Lovecraft, another Innsmouth free press anthology. I've known Sylvia for a long time. Um, and she picked <laughs> it out of the slush. This was like the first thing of mine that she'd ever, looked at and I wrote the story called The Infernal History of the Ivy Ridge Twins, which is like another, this is like 18th century night on Ask Lovecraft After Dark, um, which is an 18th century picaresque about like two twin sort of sorceress weirdos who, sure. um, yeah, it's, it is really weird. And I wrote it a million and a half years ago, but she picked it up and um, it got reprinted in um, the Book of Cthulhu that Ross Lockhart edited back in the oh, day. Oh, right. Yeah. Based on reading that, my editor, Cameron Pierce um, of LF Press, uh, contacted me and was like, have you ever considered expanding this into a novel? And I was like, no, but I would like to write several stories about this family in the, in the manner of Blackadder. <laughs> and he was like, all right. And so I ended up writing A Pretty Mouth, which is the infernal history of the Ivy Ridge Twins and the Hour of the Tortoise, which was in the Book of Cthulhu 2. And then um, like a Roman set story. And then like one that's like a Bertie Wooster parody. And then the, the the title novella called A Pretty Mouth is like a alternate history about John Wilmot, the Earl of Rochester, the second Earl of Rochester, who was famous for writing dirty poetry and being the subject of that dreadful movie called The Libertine, starring oh, Johnny, the Johnny Depp. Depp. Yes. Ugh. It's bad. Yeah. No, but he was so cool. He was such an interest. I mean, he was a total piece of crap, but like he was a really interesting <laughs> historical figure. And that movie is just dreadful, right? And so this is about when him when he's still at Wadham College. Um, and that was really exciting because it got cited in a book about John Wilmot. Okay. Um, yeah, bad. like an like an academic book that like he, I don't know how this guy found it, but like I got a Google alert and I was like, what? And like found it and was just like, oh my god! And messaged him and he's like, whoa, that's really cool to hear from you. And um, so yeah, it was like that's that's cool. I've been cited, but uh, there we go. So that's like a longer novella, and that one's definitely very Lovecraftian. So that was my first book, and then Rumbolian was my second, which is like a proper collection, and that it's not like a mosaic novel, I guess. And then. I have some other things. So. Yeah. Well, we've done. So yeah, we did. We did Rebellion, which was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we did Pleasure Merchant, which we've already mm -hmm. talked about tonight. And that mm -hmm. was that was, I think, the f that, yeah, that was the first like real full length novel we reviewed of yeah. yours on the on the show. And it was that's a that's a lot of fun. That is a, <laughs> that is yeah. a, it's a very specific taste for it. But it's yeah, uh, <laughs> it's my unloved second novel, but I have a lot of affection for it. It just it, it is much loved here. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I told I told my agent once that my genre was that I have two ways of describing whatever I write, which is what the fuck did I just read? I don't know, but I liked it. That was that's my main <laughs> genre. But the other the other one is 
I don't know what this is, but I read it like, but like, it's like the people who read it like it, like, and that's, that's been my, that's been really nice is that like, if you find, if you stumble across it, it tends to be, it tends to be well reviewed and well enjoyed, which I could ask for a lot worse, you know, like I'm, I'm grateful that people have taken to my stuff and, um, even if it is, I don't know, nobody read The Pleasure Merchant, like eight people read it, but they all liked it. So there's that. So, <laughs> well, and I mean, but it, you know, I, I like period stuff. I like Regency. I like, um, yeah, I like a, I like a lot of that kind of sort of manners and and sort of what's behind facades and yeah, masks. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's that's all a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, that was that was definitely right up my alley. Uh, <laughs> right up my dirty alley. And yeah, that's uh, definitely not a G-rated read. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's called the Pleasure Merchant. Like, it's not, it's right what it says on the tin. There's, like, there's, I mean, and it's got that wonderful pink cover. Like, everything about it tells you, yeah. you know, what you're, what you're in for. Delicious. Um, um, but it was interesting then to, to read, uh, the, your, your current series, which is now out, uh, uh, the first, which is Creature of Will and, and Temper, which, which PH also read. Uh, and then you've got Creatures of Want and Ruin that are coming out. And this is interesting because this is, you know, dealing with a lot of that same kind of like, you know, manners and people in society and kind of, you know, uh, you know, rubbing up against society and what kind of happens behind closed doors. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's not it's not quite as explicit. Uh, and it's also interesting no. because it's more of a series like you've got you've, you're sort of planning this out. Can you talk a bit about that series right yeah. now? So the first one, um, Creatures of Will and Temperance is the dope cover that they put on there for me um, is, I you know, and I, I don't know, like it's it's definitely a a retelling of the picture of Dorian Gray that is completely unnecessary that you have read Dorian Gray to like. It just sort of adds a different layer, I think, for people who have read picture of Dorian Gray. Um, I mean, there is like a weird painting and there is someone named Dorina Gray, but it's like gender swapped and it's about like two sisters who can't get along and um, and then there's also demons. Uh, so yeah, I, I was I was pitching it as Dorian Gray with, with sisterhood and fencing and demons. Um, so again, like, I don't know what it is, but maybe you'll like it. Um, and so that was a fun one to write. And that came out last November. And, um, I have a lot of affection for this book. It is a lot of my sort of regular themes of longing and eros and sisterhood and relationships, but like dialed way back into a more comedy of manners that then devolves into like, people taking drugs that are full of demons to like for various <laughs> purposes. Um, but yeah, no, I'm very fond of it. And then the sequel is actually um, much more Lovecraftian than I realized when I was writing it. And then it was just sort of like Molly, like what is bread in the bone will come out in the flesh, I guess, because I <laughs> realized at some point that um, Creatures of Wanton Ruin, which is not a direct sequel, like Creatures of Will and Temperance at 1890 something. And the second one is set in the 1920s, but it's on set on Long Island in New York. And so it's bootlegging and it's a it's sort of a mashup of um like Great Gatsby style elite parties and rich people being terrible, but then with like the pulps. Um and it was a lot of crime fiction, like Dashiell Hammett and stuff like that. It's an investigative work. And then at some point I realized that there's like a crazy toxic mushroom and like a weird cult full of people with like magic powers. And I was like, Molly, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then, and so then I was like, okay, and I should own it. And so actually one of the characters, the there's two protagonists, there's Ellie West, who is loose, very loosely based on my grandmother um, in the way that Ellie is like a nature poet and a bay woman and very independent. Um, my grandmother would probably be horrified by her depiction, but that's, she's gone so she doesn't get to object. Um, <laughs> and then there's another girl, um, Delphine Coulthed, who is the the richer girl who is not natively from Long Island, but Ellie's fiance <clears throat> is super, is like a super nerd. And he's really into Lovecraft and all of the pulps and like Brent mentions like the Argosy and all of these other pulp magazines at the time because it is 1927. And so like, and, and it even makes him see less of the supernatural element because at one point when she's like, no, I'm serious, like they're wizards. He's just like, H.P. Lovecraft didn't even believe in the supernatural. Like, why should I? Like I, like, I read this stuff, but I don't believe in it. Like, this sounds completely bonkers. And so he's this weird insert character of, but he's also like a super hunk. So he's definitely like an alpha nerd. And that's kind of fun to write. So that's a lot of fun. And and what um, what sort of was the impetus to have this kind of shared world, shared series? I'm not, well, so how do I, I don't know. I saw Creatures of Will and Temper as being a standalone book, but my editor was like, what about another one? And I was like, well, all right, but I'm not good at, like for me, when 
when Creatures of Will and Temper ends, like th that, those character stories are over. Like yes. it was always intended to be a standalone, and I was really happy with the place that everyone ends up. And so I didn't want to write a direct sequel. And so I was like, well, like what if what if I did like another novel that was another time period, but then relates back. And and he liked the idea, and that's how I ended up pitching the one set in the twenties. Because yeah, I just didn't like. Well, I mean, my first, I mean, a pretty mouth like jumps around through time in that way too. I really like different time periods and different expressions, but I also wanted to write something that was thematically connected. And so indeed, um, like the original title for Creatures of Will and Temper was The Ginger Eaters, um, which they were like, that's too literary. You should come up with a different title. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And then they pitched Creatures of Will and Temper and I was like, is that less literary? All right, whatever, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not in marketing. Um, but I really liked the title, The Ginger Eaters uh, and because it harkens back to, of course, like the lotus eaters um, who consume like a weird plant to like trip balls. And so like it seemed thematically like maybe it was too literary. I don't know. But anyway, in in Creatures of Want and Ruin, there's a nature poet um, who has written a he it, it turns out that he is. He is tangentially related to the characters in the first book and has written a poem called The Ginger Eaters that is like a different take on the story we get in the first book. So they are related in that way. It's just that they're not a direct sequel. And then the third one, which was just announced, and I just got my contract for today, which is very exciting, is Creatures of Charm and Hunger, which is uh, set in the 1940s in rural England. And my brief pitch for that was teenage witches killing Nazis. And so if yeah. that sounds like what you would like, then that is the that will, that will probably please you as a book. There we go. We just watched Bed Knobs and Broomst uh, nice. um, Broomsticks. So I introduced my daughter to that. So we're we're definitely on board with uh, yeah. witches versus Nazis. <laughs> awesome. That's I have not seen that movie in so long, but I loved it, and I loved the book as a kid too. Oh right, yeah. It was it was interesting to see as what what one of my friends uh, pointed out. Like it's 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 the most not bad of the like nineteen seventies Disney movies. <laughs> it was Disney. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, I yeah, like that, that whole animated yeah. sequence with like the lion, like in the soccer mm -hmm. game and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. Man, I I remember like Angela Lansbury and I remember some bad special effects, but that's yes. well there was there's well it was the dad it was the dad from Mary Poppins as like yes. the super sketchy dude. Uh it was Angela Lansbury, like kind of mm -hmm. right between like right between her like, you know, uh sexy temptress you know uh court jester period and before the like going into matronly murder she wrote period yeah and also i mean well and that's really interesting i wonder i mean i could look it up but i won't because i'll make typing sounds but so i wonder if that was before or after the manchurian candidate oh um because like that. she's she in the in the Manchurian Candidate, she's like the evil mom, right? But she's only two years older than the guy who's playing her son. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> there's like, that. Ouch. like, oops. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, let's see. I'm I, this is my show, so I can risk some typing. Manchurian Candidate is 1962. Okay. And Bed Knobs and Broomsticks is 1971, so nine wow. years later. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, what she was wasn't. She wasn't quite yeah. Jessica Fletcher in the man in the Manchurian Candidate, but she wasn't Cleopatra. <laughs> Can you pray with that movie she was in where she's just smoking? Uh, probably. Court Jester is the one that I really like. Uh, remember, has like she's like the evil princess who's trying to like yeah. seduce everyone. Um, that's where I. That's why I sort of go to when I'm yeah. thinking of Angela Lansbury. She was in some weird, huge studio like period piece because I saw her at one point and was like, "Wow, that hot chick looks like Angela." <laughs> and it. Was. All right. There we sure. go. There we yeah. Go. Awkward. There we have it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's uh, that's very exciting. We're, I'm I'm I really enjoy uh, creatures of uh, will and temper, Thank and you. I'm excited to see what happens with the want and ruin and uh, going forward. And you've also right now got mixed drink. Now. Is that your other big collection that's happening? Oh yeah. Um, so I also have this mixed up is um, this book is a little more es <laughs> it's esoteric and strange. Like who who would guess that this was my thing? Um, but it's not. How do I describe this? This is supposed to be the book that if you don't know someone very well and you need to get them a gift, then this is the book that you should get them. Like that okay, was okay. like my co-editor and my um, goal here was to basically write, a to make a gift book. And so it is it is hardcover. It's got a fancy ribbon bookmark, hot pink. That was my choice. There we go. Um, I mean, it fits in really well with like the hot pink on the cover. And what it is, is it is cocktail recipes paired with flash, uh, flash fiction. 
loved. And so there, um, we've got some amazing voices in this book. Um, we've got Jeff Vandermeer, who obviously is like huge deal after Annihilation. The movie version of Annihilation just came out and he also wrote um, Born and A Strange Bird and also is the editor of many, many important anthologies like The Weird and The Big Book of Science Fiction and things like that. We also have um, Carmen Maria Machado in this, um, Machado, I'm not sure, uh, who has is like a National Book Award finalist for her first collection that just came out last year called Her Body and Other Stories, which is everywhere. I mean, like you cannot go online without running into some amazing piece of publicity for this book. And so she's in this book. We also have Liz Hand, who um, is a famous, an amazing writer of fantasy and science fiction. Her novella Wildling Hall is like rock and roll wicker man, I would say. It's okay. amazing. It's super, super good. We also have Benjamin Percy um, and many other great writers in here. Um, I'm trying to see if I'm missing anything that I really want to call out here. But um, oh yeah, Tim Pratt's in here. And then so that we all con we contracted a certain number of flash fictions. So they're all under 1500 words and they go along with several of the cocktail recipes in this book. And um, and that was our sort of aesthetic here was you know, you should drink a cocktail quickly so it doesn't wilt and get gross and hot, right? Like people think, this isn't part of my introduction, that people think you're not appreciating a cocktail if you slam it, but actually cocktails are meant to be drunk very, very fast. They're not supposed to get warm and, and disgusting and melty. And so um, the aesthetic purpose of this book is to encourage people to drink their drinks quickly. Just pace yourself, right? Like you don't have to drink five in a row, just everybody relax. But so example, <laughs> for example, um, Jeff's story, uh, Marmot Season, is accompanies my recipe for the Moscow Mule. Um, Carmen's story, There and Back Again, accompanies uh, my signature drink that I'm really good at making called the Corpse Survivor Number no. Two, which is I'm fond of um, not just because I think it's like the best cocktail ever, but because it's the cocktail that got me into fancy cocktails. I drank it at a bar in Austin, Texas, and I it changed my life. Like I became very interested in like pre-prohibition mixology after that, and um, so that was really cool and. Um, yeah, we've got a, my recipe for the French 75 that accompanies Selena Chambers' story and um, the only acceptable Bloody Mary recipe and a couple that I invented, such as the Henry Watton, which is based on... I, I found this a reference to this when I was reading Picture of Dorian Gray, but there's a moment where they talk about Lord Henry Watton drinking a glass of vermouth with orange bitters, and so I sort of figured out the ideal ratio of vermouth to orange bitters. Sweet vermouth, not dry. That would be too much, um, but like a really good sweet vermouth with a, with orange bitters and then stirred with ice and it's it's, it's really nice. So um, they're not difficult recipes. I tried to limit the number of esoteric ingredients because um, if this is like a starter book, I think I I tried to make it very accessible for someone with a home bar. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm really proud of this book and it's I, um, I really do think it is ideal to give to like your nephew that you see once every three years and are not sure, but you once saw him drinking a drink. Well, it's it's graduation season now, so yeah. obviously this is a great time, you know. It's for, a public for... service. <laughs> so, yeah. And do you enjoy the, I mean, the editing process, something you enjoy as far as the kind of, you know, the piecing together things and trying to like sort of the puzzle working of it all? Sort of. Um, so my co-editor is Nick Lamatas on this one, and he really did most of the fiction editing. I edited a few stories, but, I was mainly the cocktail editor. Editing is something that I have tried my hand at a couple of times and I just never feel as comfortable with it as I do writing. Like my, I feel like my place is like penitent, not like, <laughs> um, not person making the decisions. Like I, 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 I had to abandon a magazine. I hope to go back to it one day, but I had a literary erotica magazine that I had a few issues come out with and um, like going through and reading for that, like it just really, was hard for me to reject people. And, oh, the, okay. and, and the anthology that I co-edited with my friend, Jesse Bullington, Swords v. Cthulhu, that was also really hard. I had to send some rejections that I didn't want to send and I really just didn't like it. And it was just like, no, this isn't the feeling I should be having. I should be having the other feeling of being rejected. Like, this is not me. <laughs> and so I, I, it's not something that I plan to do a lot of, like I really enjoyed Mixed Up mostly because it was like, why don't you work on your cocktail recipes, Molly, and then like write them down when you're still super sober enough to, <laughs> Remember what you did, uh, which like, I know it was like a huge sacrifice, but I managed to do it. And, uh, and so that was really fun, but I'm not, I like the, the grunt work of editing. Like I like getting in there with people's sentences and 
and playing with word and, and varying tone and things like that and like helping people get their writing where it needs to be. But the actual process of editing being like, this stinks, this is great. Like, I don't like that at all. That is just hard for me. Oh, I can understand. Well, I, you know, someone who's done, um, you know, acting and been in like, you know, so many auditions, it is so weird to then be on the other side of the table and to like watch folks come up and like, you know, there you, you sense that same nervous energy that you would have. Um, and then just sort of like to kind of coldly or dispassionately just sort of, you know, be like, nope, 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 uh, maybe, nope, nope. Oh, yeah. like circle, circle, circle. And it's, and you realize, you realize all the variables that are out of the control of the person interviewing or auditioning. Again, they just, they have no control over it. It's just, oh, they were like five inches too tall for, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> who, what we had, you know, we've already cast this part and like, they, you know, like it's just things that they can't have any uh, say over. And I imagine there's a similar sort of feeling of like, oh, this is so arbitrary uh, that you don't have in your mind when you're putting something out there and like, this is personal, they rejected me or I got to yeah. this because, you know, I'm amazing. Not that you are amazing. So everything you get into is because you're amazing. Um, oh, well, thank you. No, I mean, some, I mean, it's it's very true that with editing, it, it is sort of like that. Like, I mean, with Swords of Cthulhu, like, there were a couple stories that we rejected because we had already accepted something similar, or we we had two stories that were very similar, and one of them was just like that much better, or had like that much more zing or panache, and that was really tough because it was just like, yeah, like if if we hadn't gotten the story, like you would have been in here, but we didn't. So like, there you go, and like. I've definitely been pinged for anthologies. I don't do as much short story writing anymore, but I've definitely had people come to me be, being like, we need a chick, which I will always it's like, <laughs> all right, like, I don't, I don't mind it. Like I, I don't, you know, I appreciate, I guess like, I mean, I understand that people would find that some people would find that like tokenizing or offensive, but for me, it's like, you're, you're doing, you're, you know what, first of all, I will get some money. And second of all, like, yes, like it is good to have, Women and I am happy to be that chick. Like that is fine. I've definitely had someone come to me and be like, we don't have any stories in this that are even remotely like saucy or humorous. And we know this is what you do. And and I'm just kind of like, wow, oh, that's kind of, I don't know. I don't want to be pigeonholed as like the funny author. Cause I, while I do usually have elements of humor in my writing or at least like biting awkwardness. Like I don't, I'm not like the Dave Barry of Lovecraftiana or anything. Like, I don't <laughs> like that reference just dated me. Um, the thing about Shagoths is. Oh my God. Yeah. The Andy Rooney person. Like, no, <laughs> oh my God. No, I, I do like, I do find that horror and humor go really well together. And I do, I always say that Jane Austen is my favorite horror writer because she, um, cause there's nothing. Cause like, it is true that like ghosts and killers are scary, but there's absolutely nothing in my world at least that's more terrible than being stuck at a party that sucks that you can't leave <laughs> and so like i you know and i sort of that's that's the kind of awkwardness that i really like to work with is the like <laughs> oh like i can't go or like oh i said this thing and i'm gonna think about it for like seven years every night um so i don't mind being asked to do the to basically like do a thing but um you know, anthologies are often, they are composite works and they sometimes need someone to fill a role and, and that's, that's okay. But like, I don't know, I imagine it's sort of similar to casting in that, like you are fitting people, you are fitting people into the roles they need to fit into. And sometimes a little, you know, there's gotta be like constraints in that way too. Well, it's, it's that being able to see the whole, or at least what you imagine the whole is versus when you're auditioning, when you've only got that like laser focus of like, okay, this yeah. is the monologue I've picked and oh, that, you know, I'm going to be and, dog and, That's right. And then you, and then you just, you're, you know, you spend all that time after the audition, like, what did I do wrong? And then after you're not cast, you're like, oh, but I've, oh, I, but I, if I had known I could have done this. No, it's, it's, um, it's rough. <laughs> it's a weird, and, and, and to swap roles like that. Cause there was a period of time when I was sort of both auditioning and was producing or, or oh directing. God stuff and yeah. it was um yeah it's weird and, <laughs> and you make weird just you make weird decisions when you're someone who's uh mostly an actor and not a director like the time i was uh i directed a short two-hander uh called shark week and it was about like two guys watching shark week and like coming to terms with their like growing up and growing apart and what have you uh and cast two great guys i loved them both and it was killing me because i had no idea which one i wanted to play which you know, like they're like, they're both so good. And like, I had them like, you know, our first session we sat down, I'm like, okay, I want you to read. Cause it was short, it was a short one act or not even one act. It was like, it's just like a short, like five, 10 minute play. I was like, I want you to read for this character and you to read for that character. All right, now swap and sort of sat there and watched. And afterward, like, guys, what if we have you do both and you'll just alternate each night? 
Oh, well, that's cool. And they were like, okay, I think we've been drinking. Uh, and my stage manager <laughs> is like, looks up from her notes. <laughs> Because there was a fight scene in this, oh. like that had so we had to when we choreographed it, it had to be like they had to learn it both ways. But it was it was fantastic, and we had you know it was the same show, but it was done in these two very different ways, and they huh. and they produced two very different energies, and it worked this time. It shouldn't have worked. It was a terrible it's idea. Cool. <laughs> but like it was it was nice to to be like oh okay this 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 time I can I my my cra I got away with my my crazy plan. Um, yeah, and I think. And I, I never worked with either actor again. I don't. I think. I think we parted on good terms. But <laughs> um, that sounds like really interesting and ambitious. I mean, like, I love watching different people play different roles and like comparing them and stuff like that. And to have the uh, like to have the possibility of that happening, like going to like a matinee or an evening performance or going back a Tuesday and then a Wednesday sounds like really, really interesting. So, well, that was the other side was to like, try to like encourage, Hey, you saw it, you saw it this way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like uh, when they made clue and they put the, what if I endings. blew your mind? Yeah. <laughs> mind freak. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so I have to take a minute. Uh, sorry, Molly. I, I have to address some guff I'm getting uh, in the well, chatter. Uh, yeah, what? Uh, someone uh, is uh, taking umbrage with my uh, praise for Mannequin, despite the fact that Mannequin is a fantastic film, which I'm sure if I went back and watched would not find that it is aged terribly and has horrible homophobic <laughs> elements with Hollywood and weird like I mean, South Asian stereotypes and all sorts of awful things. This sounds like some serious guff. Yeah. Uh, I, but why? Yeah, uh, I, I, like a mannequin, I saw a mannequin where uh, I think we got like a, like a taped off of television or some kind of VHS copy. Yeah. Uh, That's how I was, really like, I was like, I was like 10 years old. And it was just like, oh, like now I understand the beauty of womanhood. Like this, this film, like Kim Cattrall has awakened inside me, you know, this, yeah. this yeah. understanding of just like what, what I will now seek. Um, Huh. So, so I will always hold that special place sure. uh, deep in my heart, Carlos. So there you go. Uh, we oh, do have Carlos. All right, that makes sense. Carlos. Uh, we have some uh, questions from the folks uh, watching at home. Uh, uh, rating thespian, or sorry, ranting thespian, uh, wants to know uh, if uh, what, which which of your books or stories would you recommend for someone new to your work? Like, what's a good kind of jumping off point? I would say. Um, that Creatures of Will and Temper is my favorite book I've ever written. Like, I, I know you're not supposed to pick among your children or whatever, but like, <laughs> I just think I really hit my stride with that book and I'm really, really, really flipping proud of it. Like I, I, I got the idea from it. I, okay, I'll guess, can I tell Can I tell the real version? Well, oh, I was told. Yes, yes, please tell the real version. It's legal in Colorado. Um, yes. So like, <laughs> This is so, all what whatever's coming next is all satire and parody, so no one can. Yeah, yeah, can, yeah. Um, well, I, I once I once had someone be like, "What? But if you if you tell the real story, aren't you confessing to a crime?" And it's like, "Come at me, Jeff Sessions." All right, but anyway, like, um, so I was I try every year to read at least one novel that I should have read before. Okay. Um, and this started with uh, when Ghost of a Watchman came out, and everyone was like really salty about uh, Harper Lee. I was like, I've never read To Kill a Mockingbird. Like I grew up in Georgia where we did not discuss race. And then I moved to Florida and by and and they would have taught it in public school there, but I was already in like middle school and I was well beyond it. So I was like, I'm gonna read To Kill a Mockingbird. It's like, oh that's why this is a big deal. It's, this book is extremely well written. It is hugely problematic obviously, but the, the prose level writing of it, I was just like, all right, I grew up in the South and lived through many a southern summer and this book is basically like sick it is like dro droning in your ear. Like I mean it was <laughs> amazing. Um, and so I, I started this tradition and, and a couple of years ago, the book was Picture of Dorian Gray because I had never read it, even though I did like a master's in like 18th and, 18th and 19th century British lit. And I'm like super into like weird occult and I picked it up and there's a scene where um, Lord Henry Watton is, gives Dorian Gray, he's already sort of like seduced him to the dark side, but he gives him this um, yellow bound novel that we know now is, it's not named in the, in, Dorian Gray, but we know it's Against the Grain by, oh, I can't ever pronounce this guy's name, Joris Carl Hussmann. I do not speak French. And um, it's this decadent symbolist novel about this guy who is a jerk and it's fine. And Dorian Gray <laughs> reads it and it's like, what if I was a jerk? And um, and I was reading this and I was like smoking a joint and it was like high summer and it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. It's not usually my way, but it was Sunday morning. And I was like, all right, I'm drinking this mimosa, I'm smoking this joint. Like, And then I was like, what if, 
Lord Henry was a diabolist and was like giving him a manual on how to summon demons. Like that would be so dope. And I wrote the idea down and came back to it when I was more sober. And I was like, this still sounds cool. <laughs> and I, um, and it was, and I, I decided to just write this book. Um, and I, it's, you know, I just, I knew it would have to be about ladies because I usually write about women's issues, but it just, I set out to write this book. I wrote this book. I'm really proud of it. I think it has some of the best dialogue I've ever written. I think it has some of the tensest scenes I've ever written. I literally learned to fence, to make the fencing scenes realistic in this. Like I went to um, the fencing school that the guy who used to put together the US Olympic fencing team teaches at and I trained under him for a little oh, while. Dang. Um, yeah. And so, and I've been told that the fencing is actually like pretty legit for someone who took like, I mean, like four lessons, but like, you know, like <laughs> it, I really did. And I got, I got a lot of bruises and, um, and I learned some stuff. So I'm just like really super proud of it. And I, I have huge affection for it. And it, you know, it's got everything I like and that there's just like weird descriptions of people eating things and like tense scenes in front of paintings that are like reflected of the reflective of the painting, but like also about the people's like myopic sense and sensibility. Like, I don't know, I'm super into it. Um, so I would say start there because I think it's very polished and I'm pleased with it. So well, it is pH approved. Thanks. Yeah, no, I appreciate it that pH liked it. I didn't know if it would have enough dirty stuff in it because it really is quite a dial back from the pleasure merchant. There's like one, there's like there's one scene and it's very brief. So well, that's like, all right. Which is just like page, chapter one, it's just like, oh, okay, that's this kind of book. So <laughs> Uh, but speaking of, uh, a, a follow-up question is, if you had to spend 10 minutes with one of them alone, would you choose HP or PH? Uh, dang. I I really would rather play on that D&D &D game in my, favorite, <laughs> in my favorite episode ever of Ask Lovecraft. But I guess if it was... I guess, oh man, I don't know. That's so tough. I like my baser instinct is like pH, duh. Like we would drink day wine and like, ah. <laughs> talk shit. but like, I don't know. Like, I mean, I had a really good time with Mr. Lovecraft when I was sort of bullied into doing an interview when I was completely unready at the Lovecraft Film Festival. So that was- Oh, really that's cool. right. Oh, I totally did believe yeah, I totally was just totally like, all right, Molly, we're doing, we're doing this. All right, let's go. Yeah, Get and your... I was just like, I, 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 I've never met this person. Okay. <laughs> Get your period hat. Really we got to do this. Oh yeah, the hat, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, that was a cop-out answer. PH probably, I don't know. I feel like that's we right. get along. <laughs> well, this has been an absolute blast. Molly, thank you so much for oh, being pleasure. on the show, for coming on After Dark. Uh, obviously we need to have you on again so we can learn about more 19th century decadent figures. <laughs> yeah, sorry so much of that was me talking about Thomas Day, but once I start thinking about him, I just like, I just want everyone to know about Thomas Day because he's just so fascinating and I and, he, and I don't think he's nearly notorious enough. Like, I mean, for just being like a total kook, like it's like this person is mesmerizing and yet, I don't know. Well, Wendy Moore has that ability to just like oh. take people and and transform them and make you obsessed with them. Like after I read <laughs> Knife Man, I was just like grabbing everyone by the lapels and be like, do you understand what Charles Hunters did for yeah. like surgery? <laughs> For surgery, oh my god, yeah, no, I that one's been on my list for a while, and she has another that I've also had in my Amazon queue to like pick up at some point that I want to read, just like a gripping true pop history of some weirdo from days of yore, and it's like, yeah, <laughs> yes, so. there we go, bring it. Uh, so, uh, what can so folks uh, can find all of your fine books uh, in stores now? Uh, what uh, can folks uh, look forward to besides? Um, uh, let's see, you said the third book in the series is announced, but there's no date for it yet. It'll be out in the spring of 2020. Okay. Um, but the Creatures of Wanton Ruin will be out in November of this year, about ex nice. exactly a year from when the first one came out. And nice. other than that, I'm not like I have the story coming forthcoming in Sisterhood, and um, I'll have a short story in Lightspeed later, much later this year. Um, that's about um, like a near future cosmetic procedure where you can get injections that make your face like a mannequin's face. You'll probably really like it actually. Like even Yay! the color. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you can only sort of, it's like Vanta black, but your flesh tone and it, um, it molds to your face so that people can't see your facial expressions. And it's like a short story about people being miserable and doing that to themselves. So very cool. Nice. Yeah. And uh, where can folks find you online if you wish to be found? Um, I'm on Facebook, but I do tend to vet requests. So like send me a note because otherwise I'll just be like, who is this person? And probably 
not accept it. Um, but I'm on Twitter and my Twitter is public. I'm at Molly underscore the underscore tans. And I have a website, mollytanser.com, but I I don't remember the last time I updated the blog. And I always mean to set up a newsletter and like set, do a newsletter, but it's me. So I just flake constantly. Twitter is probably the best. My Instagram is full of pictures of my very adorable cat. So that's oh, another good yes. place. I think very I'm just cat. Molly Tanzer on Insta. Most importantly, are we going to get any more reviews of 80s action movies and or gore? The gore thing, sadly, so um, so the the gore thing, the website that was hosting that ended up closing. It's oh, all been archived, okay. um, but Porno Kitsch is no more. It was not a porn site, uh, but Porno Kitsch <laughs> is no more. It's just that um, the site administrators are busy saving the world in other ways. Fair so enough. sadly, I missed my shot to do the fourth gore novel, though I did read it, and I think that's the one with the giant grasshoppers, and it was just not cool. And yeah, I occasionally still try to go back and watch um, some action movies on my own, but um, that series also sort of ended, but um, the archive of it is on my site and also on Porno Kitsch, like a lot of the highlights of the former movie review blog I ran called uh, Films of High Adventure can still be found online and you can see me like wax nostalgic about Conan and also rant about Lady Hawk and like other such gems of the past, like I was thinking too, when you were talking about how mannequin sort of did what needed to be done for you, like the sad thing is, is that for me, that was legend. Nice. With Tim Curry in okay. the role of Kim Cattrall mannequin. And um, I went back and rewatched it and was like, I should not have done this. Like I should have just let this movie be in my mind. It was <laughs> dreadful beyond all excusability. And I, and uh, so, yeah, I don't know. No, like, no. Did you go back and watch the one with the, like the tangerine dream score or the other one? I have the, I have the, I have, I don't want to say it's the Criterion edition. I don't think it's Criterion, but I have one that has both. Okay. All right. So I've seen, I have seen both of them and, and it's just like, I don't know, whichever one is the one that, I mean, maybe they both have the end credit song that has the lyric, so be good for goodness sake, but it's just like, this movie stinks and I should not have ever <laughs> gone back and looked at it because I just, my memory of it as a child is like the greatest movie ever made. And then I went back and watched it. It was like, you know, what killed it actually for me was when I looked it up to write about it, I learned that Tim Curry's character's name is Darkness. Yes. And it's just like, that's dumb. <laughs> that's just not good. Like you could have, there's like, you could have gotten the big book of angels out of the library. You could have gotten this, the, all, the big book of demons as well. They have these books. Like you could have translated darkness into some language that people wouldn't immediately recognize, but it's just so <laughs> gooberish and terrible that every time he sort of like talks at her and that voice that I love, I'm just like, what's up darkness. And like <laughs> for then and forever, it's just, it had lost all of its glamor for me. Oh, I hope someone out there has done a cover of, I believe in a thing called love in that darkness voice. Cause that would be amazing. I can't amazing. even do it where it's like got so much like saliva in the back of this throat, <laughs> and, but like and the somehow awful, it's sexy. The awful like, like teeth that are just taking up 80% of his mouth. And those horns, it's just like, oh, so you're just the devil. Like, all right. Also, also <laughs> that was your choice. Like why? Like why? Like, yeah, I, I don't know that, that movie. So many wrong choices were made. Well, I think I was so confused because when, when someone was like, oh, you should watch this. It was sold to me as like a live adaptation or like version of the last unicorn which it is not no i think someone's like there's unicorns and like he's got horns like the red bull so that's the same thing also I, let me be the one to kill the unicorn like no it's definitely <laughs> not the same thing at all like no. um there's no musical numbers in it that i remember and also right, it is right. far less depressing than the last unicorn Last Unicorn has aged well. I mean, the the like the music by America is <laughs> music by America, but it's it still speaks to me, right? Like, yes, it's ridiculous. Yes, they're just singing what like they're seeing on the screen. <laughs> but no, man, the <laughs> book is it. also a tremendous work of fantasy. I mean, it is just so good and brutal, and the movie doesn't really. I mean, for being, I mean, and I mean, the Last Unicorn is the first movie I ever remember watching. Yeah. Like I have a distinct memory of being in preschool and them turning it on and being mad at my mom that she came early to get me because I didn't want to go home. I wanted to find out what happened. But um, like I just have such affection for it and they don't shy away from like what's going on. Like no. the ending is just like, okay, <laughs> like, ending, like great. All right, cool. Like what's up me, Pharaoh? Like, so I don't know. It's just really it's a powerful work and, and I and I love the novel, but the movie just it's even the Rankin Bass animation 
I still yeah, love I, the look of. I, I love like the three movies that you know had that distinctive style of The Hobbit, The Last Unicorn, mm -hmm. and Return of the King. Like, oh my God. yes, they're, yes, they're cheese town, but there's just something so evocative about them. Like, oh just my like, God. The, like the, everyone's knuckles are like just so perfectly you know rendered. I remember <laughs> I remember being on a, a, a subway in Toronto and seeing two people that were live action Rankin and Bass characters. Oh. Like they were just so like wrinkled and had so many like like textures and like distinguishing characters. It was it was I was just what <laughs> what cool world style shenanigans have gone on Amazing. to bring us here. Yeah, I the Hobbit is still I still think is the best. Tolkien adaptation that has ever been done. Like I love the Lord of the Rings films. I think they're great. Like I, I will never say a word against the three of those films except for a few minor nerd quibbles here and there. Sure. But the Hobbit movies are execrable, and the Old Rankin Bass Hobbit just has this power over me when I hear the theme song or when like I hear the Gandalf voice. The greatest like, yeah. adventure, Glenn yeah, Garbro yeah. with his like so warble. Good. I can't tell if it's in his voice or is like just bad audio. I don't know. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Like the VHS <laughs> war, war. No. And, and the return of the King, like I, I feel like it's aged less well, but I do, I will always appreciate the Frodo of the nine fingers song because of the line, how did he get nine fingers? And it's like, great <laughs> job. There's this like, ring of doom. yeah, no, the one that they did that is not aged nearly as well as <laughs> all three of those is um, flight of dragons. Oh, which, is that the fat dragons? It's Fat Dragons. Yeah, it's Fat Dragons. It's James Earl Jones as a wizard. It's it's many offensive ethnic stereotypes. There's like a Ooh. chick, Robin Hood, and um, I forget who it is who's the main guy's voice, but he's from like some sitcom, and it's <laughs> definitely trying to cash in on Dungeons and Dragons because the plot of it is this guy invents a board game where you play like a wizard or something, and he goes, but like the proprietor of this like magic, like a shop that is clearly where you would go to play Magic the Gathering in like our world, but in this, it's just like okay. a game shop and he pitches it to him, but then like magic happens and he's- Oh, John Ritter. John Ritter, that's who there it is. There we go. It's really <laughs> weird. Um, and he's sucked into this world of magic and, and dragons, but there's a wacky mix up and he ends up in the body of a dragon named Gorbash because it's actually based on this book called The Dragon and, and the George by like Gordon R. Dickinson or something like that, oh, um, okay. which was like a computer mishap that caused him to become a dragon in another world. Um, but yeah, that movie has not aged well because the solution to the fantastical problem of James Earl Jones being an evil wizard is that John Ritter defeats him, spoiler alert, but this movie came out in the 70s, defeats him by listing all the sciences in alphabetical order. So he's like astronomy, anthropology, biology, chemistry, something with a D like, I don't know. And like, he just keeps like shrinking down and becoming like, no, no, like science, I have powerless before science. It's like, this would be things. Like, it's really bad. Don't ever watch it. Yay. So there we go, guys. Watch Mannequin. Don't watch Legend. Watch The Hobbit. Don't watch Flight of Dragons. Don't watch Flight of Dragons ever. Well, thank you. I knew we'd eventually get to 80s movies, which is, you know, yeah. again, we'll, have, we'll have you back on to go back over the list. So um, if folks are uh, if folks are not aware, this is uh, Ask Lovecraft After Dark. It is uh, the uh, sister project to Ask Lovecraft, the advice show uh, starring H.P. Lovecraft, which can be found at asklovecraft.com. Uh, if you've enjoyed this show, if you're interested in being part of uh, future conversations, uh, you can join the Ask Lovecraft Appreciation Society over at Facebook. We have a lot of fun conversations. Uh, uh, someone compared it to uh, a, like an art commune at one point, but I'll take that. I, 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 you know, there's some really cool, sure. uh, there's some really cool uh, original art and original music that folks have shared. That's been fantastic, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a nice place for attractive, talented people. So if uh, you're interested yeah. in that, come on over. Uh, otherwise, you can follow me. Uh, you can follow Ask Lovecraft on Twitter. You can follow sort of my rants and uh, ravings uh, over on Twitter at Lehman Kessler. And if you're interested in live shows or like sort of just an archive of what uh, all I've done, you can go to LehmanKessler.com and that'll do it. So once again, Molly, thank you so much. Thank you. This thank you to very everyone fun. who has been watching. Thank you to everyone who will eventually be watching. Uh, this has been an absolute blast, and uh, we'll be back uh, in a little while. So uh, until then, bye, guys. Farewell.